Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Today we'll acknowledge the summer travel season with a man who has found travel to be a calling. Many in St. Louis will know Bill Cleveland. He talks about travel on the radio and in podcasts and writes about it online and elsewhere. Now there's a book. It's titled 100 Things to Do in America Before You Die. In it, he talks about what he calls uniquely American experiences. We welcome Bill to the studio. Bill, great to have you. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Well, I have to tell you, the, the, the word unique is a very specific word. It means there's nothing else like it. If yeah, it, I mean, you know, there are so many things that you can do when you travel across the United States, but I wanted people to do things that they would absolutely remember when they got back home. So whether that is, you know, having Thomas Jefferson ice cream at Mount Rushmore or going to, you know, stand inside the world's largest mailbox in Casey, Illinois, you know, these are things that are specific. Um, they're things that um, you know, families especially. I love promoting road trips for families, um, but things that they're going to remember, and I thought that was important. How did you come up with this idea? I mean, that's t taking on a, a subject matter like this, 100 places to visit, is a, that's got to be a terrific challenge. <laughs> a lot of index cards all over the living room yeah. floor. Um, you know, I was actually approached to write a book on Route 66, and, you know, I'm probably the first writer in history to tell a publisher, no, I'm not interested. Um, but I counter offered with, I said, hey, how about a hundred things to do in America book? I know Reedy Press had the line of hundred things books they do in a lot of cities, mm -hmm. including here in St. Louis. And so I said, what about a hundred things to do in America? And I don't think they were gung ho right off the bat, but I think I convinced them. And I, yeah, I think it's one of their better selling books at the moment. Um, and it's been great. And so sort of the, you know, I came up with the hundred things. You know, I wanted to cover, um, you know, obviously um, you know, food and culture and history. But but what are some of these things that, uh, again, back to experiences, um, things that people can do and, you know, they, they can't experience them anywhere else. And so, it, but it was tough. It was tough to come up with things. And I, I tried to find, and I think people will find in the book that these are things that you're only going to be able to do in America. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some people say, well, how come you didn't promote, you know, this beach or you didn't? I said, well, yeah, there's beaches in, you know, Europe and Australia, wherever, you know, you can do the beaches other places or certain things. So, but, you know, but you're not going to find a, you know, Sun Studio in Memphis where Elvis Presley was discovered. So everything in here, um, I tried my best to include as many states as possible. Um, I have no problem telling you I missed a few. And in my index cards all over the floor, I kind of screwed that up a little bit. Um, but most states are covered. Um, and and um, I think it turned out pretty good. So the next book is 100 Things to Do Around the World. Is that, uh, is that the next project? <laughs> my dad, who's in the other room, told me, he said, you ought to do 100 Things Not to Do in America, uh -huh. which I, I would never do because everything I do for Bill on the Road is very positive. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, you know, we have so much negativity right now, and people are always fighting about the silliest things. And, I, and so uh, from when I started this in 2013, uh, BillOnTheRoad.com and, and all these travels and all the things that I do, everything I do is positive. So if I go to a place, um, you know, let's just, say Detroit. And, you know, if I see something I don't like, I don't write about it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help me, really. It doesn't help them. Um, and so everything that I do when I can, and I didn't mean to pick out Detroit as though I found a bunch of, I loved Detroit, actually, which people are always stunned when I talk about places like that. It's like, Detroit, really? Like, yeah. So it's sort of a mission for me to find something positive about every place that I go. Did you have trouble coming up with 100? No, I, I mean, I had way more than 100. And I, I pulled most of them from places that I had already been and things that I had done. So, um, you know, I, I'm kind of a goofball in a sense that I, I like finding these little quirky, out-of-the-way things to do. And so it helped in this project to have those all right. So I went through, wrote down the, you know, the things that really just popped off my head and then went back and did a little more research to find things that maybe even I hadn't experienced quite yet um, to come up with the 100. Where did you start? Wow. Where did I start? Well, I was talking to you before we started on the air that um, I spent a lot of time in South Dakota. And so I mentioned the uh, Mount Rushmore experience, this having Thomas Jefferson ice cream. And that was one of, if it wasn't the first, it was one mm -hmm. of the first. Because most people, when you go to Mount Rushmore and everyone listening who has traveled and you've you know hopped in the station wagon and you've gone there, you go and you see the big heads and then, okay, well, and you hop back in the car and you leave. Yeah. And so what people don't know is that at uh, at Mount Rushmore, you can have Thomas Jefferson's version of ice cream. He was actually the first person credited with writing down a recipe for ice cream. And they serve 
his recipe at at Mount Rushmore. Most people don't know that. The milk is pasteurized these days, but it's still the same recipe. You know, I'm, I'm glad to learn there's something else to do there because my opinion of Mount Rushmore is you can get the same effect by looking at a picture, right? It, you know, it, and I hate to say this because there's probably people planning a trip later this summer. And they're like, oh, man. Um, it, it First of all, you, you do appreciate the work that went into it. I mean, there's 60-foot you know, heads. Sure. Um, what's cool if, you know, if people go into the little museum, you'll see what Mount, Ru- Mount Rushmore was um, supposed to look like. And so it looks a lot different than, you know, they were going to put the whole bodies on these, you know. Mm-hmm. And so to see how it kind of turned out, yeah, it's cool. The lighting ceremony at the end of the day is what's pretty neat. They light it up and they do a nice, you know, ceremony. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you go in and you see it and you're you're going to hit the road in 20 minutes. So. No no, Cary Grant uh, on set for that. No, for that no, visit. no. But, uh, but still, it is, I, it made it into the book, but again, uh, tying it into a unique experience is to have that ice cream. How about Missouri? I mean, we got... Plenty of things here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, several of them uh, were from Missouri. Uh, and Illinois, I should hasten to add. Yeah, and we <laughs> just, you know, we were just talking about how close we are to the fabulous Fox Theater. Uh, one of the experiences is to see a show at the Fox Theater, because I think, especially here in St. Louis, hopefully people know how lucky we are to have that. There are just a few left. There are th- only three left. Um, St. Louis, Atlanta, and, uh, oh my God, Detroit. And so, yeah, I mean, for people, and I guess it's possible there are people listening who have never been into the Fox Theater. I find that hard to believe, but I do meet people on occasion. Like, you know, I've never actually done it. I've never actually gone there. And so I actually think it's kind of fun to bring people who have never been in and just the look on their face when they're looking around and they're just, they just cannot believe how beautiful it is. Um, so that's one of the experiences uh, is to see a show at the Fox. Uh, the other, you know, there's a few others in Missouri. Um, you know, one that I talk about is uh, Hannibal, Missouri. And so, you know, the, the Mark Twain history, um, you know, the river history, uh, t- Tom Sawyer's fence is the, you know, to get a picture taken in front of Tom Sawyer's fence. One of the things that, and I, Don, I hate the phrase uh, selfie. I don't, I don't like the word yeah, selfie. Uh, maybe I'm too much of an old soul, but. But I use the the term photo opportunity. Mm -hmm. So in the book, there's a chapter on photo opportunities. And so uh, one of them is having a picture taken in front of Thomas, uh, not Thomas Jefferson's fence, uh, Tom Sawyer's fence uh, in Hannibal because it's cool. And if you've never been, it's it's really neat. They lay out all of the Mark Twain um, stories and, you know, you can go in his boyhood home and get down to the Mark Twain cave. Um, But the experience, at least the one I put in the book, was having your picture taken in front of Tom Sawyer's fence. Hannibal is uh, relatively close, but many of the places that you write about about are not. How, how do you fund something like this? I mean, that's it's not inexpensive to travel. Uh, I have sponsors, thank the good Lord above. Um, I work very closely with a lot of the cities that I represent, or not represent, but that I write about and that I cover. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that is one thing that people ask, like, how does this all work? So I work with, um, every city has what they call a Convention and Visitors Bureau. We have one here in St. Louis. And if a town is too small to have one, they usually um, are, they work through a visitor center in the Chamber of Commerce in these little small towns. And so essentially I pick a route and figure out where I want to go on a trip. I have one, uh, for example, coming up in August. I'll go through Michigan. I'll go all the way around Lake Michigan. And so I reach out to these cities. I approach them. Thankfully, now I'm known enough in, in some of these travel circles where people are welcoming. Um, it wasn't always that easy when I started. Um, and so they usually will pick up the cost for hotels, which is a huge help. Um, I probably could not do it if that wasn't the case in, you know, most of the time. Um, and then they also, they know the story. So they know their communities. They know the people that I would find interesting to interview. Um, they know the different museums and whatever. And so it's, they're, they're very, very helpful entities. And what I think most people should know is that, yes, it's great for me as a travel writer, but as a tourist, somebody who's just traveling, they're, they're, it's a free resource for you as well. You know, it's not just for the media. You know, if you're traveling to, you know, Traverse City, Michigan, you can call their CVB or go on their website, find all kinds of great story idea or travel, you know, ideas, things that you can do in town. And they'll, they'll tell you, Hey, where, you know, where you're going to park or where you should stay at night. Um, so I use them a lot. But if they're footing the bill or helping foot the bill, uh, does that put any pressure on you with regard to objectivity? So they don't they don't pay. I, I do not take any money at all from any destination. Mm-hmm. And you're right. And that would be a huge yeah. no, no. Um, you know, there have been times where I have been paid by um, states or cities to produce content for a website or something like that. But to promote something specific. So like I just did a story in um, Iowa on quirky places to stay. Well, 
I actually went to Iowa and I stayed in like one night I slept in a a train caboose. One night I stayed in a gas station. One night I slept in a grain silo. So fun stuff like that. I have no problem taking that. Um, For the other stories that I do, yeah, they I never make any money off of it. Uh, Everything is done through sponsors that I have, uh, through radio reports that I do, um, or other you know articles that I may write for a magazine or something like that. Is there uh, of the hundred you have here? Is there a favorite? No, um, I, I don't have necessarily one favorite. One that I do talk about a lot because I do these public events where I, you know, take questions and things. People do ask that on occasion, mm-hmm. and so you know, I come back to um, we mentioned Sun Studio in Memphis, and I, I, for whatever reason, I just I'm always drawn to the fact that you can go in and stand in a place where, um, you know, Elvis Presley was discovered and where he did his first. Um, you know, his, his first songs and he first, you know, started singing. And so what you do is you go through the little museum. It's very small. You go into Sun Studio and you stand in the spot where he would record. And what's really cool is you look around and nothing has changed. Everything is exactly the same way that it was when Elvis stood there. You know, I jokingly will say to people, you look up and you think the tiles on the ceiling are going to fall on your head. Like nothing has been updated. The linoleum floor is still the same. Everything's the same. And so, yeah, it, it's cool from a, a music music history perspective, but from a perspective of, you know, just thinking about how America changed and even the world changed because of that moment. And, you know, you get goosebumps when you just start sitting there thinking or standing there in that spot, you hear a recording of Elvis, his first, I don't mean like his first song, I mean him stepping up going, check one, two, three, mm-hmm. this mic on, you know, you hear that and um, it's pretty neat because think of all the things that changed, the th- you know, clothing, the way people were dancing, the things that sort of became culturally acceptable that were not acceptable before Elvis came along and shook yeah. things up. Um, so that probably is certainly one of my, my favorite experiences. Did, did you say Elvis shook things up? He shook things <laughs> up and I didn't even have to write that out, Don, that just came right off the nod. Uh-huh. Bill Cleveland <laughs> is our guest. We're going to take a break now, come back and continue talking about his book, 100 Things to Do in America Before You Die. And we'd like to hear from you. Perhaps you'd like to know if a favorite place of yours would be included in Bill's book. Give us a call at 382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Send us an email to talk at stlpublicradio.org. Or if you would prefer to send a tweet, do so at STL on Air. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. Welcome back to our conversation with Bill Cleveland. He's the author of 100 Things to Do in America Before You Die. Bill, you broke the uh, the uh, categories down into, I think, five different groups, food and entertainment and that sort of yeah. things. Well, let's let's take a look at each one of them. For instance, uh, what, what's your uh, most vivid recollection in the food category? Well, it's funny you say Asi- this. Aside from ice cream at uh, right. Mount Rushmore. Y- you know, the, the first food item that I put in, so my book is now in its second edition. The first one, so I was so excited. So Jackson, Mississippi, there was this fried chicken place. And I'm telling you, the greatest fried chicken I've ever had. It was called Two Sisters and went there uh, for lunch. And, and it was just, it was unbelievable. And so, I, so I, I made a note of it. And when I started thinking through the food category, um, the, the first thing that I wrote down, two sisters, fried chicken. I was so excited. And I, I called them. I said, look, you're going to be in this book. And, and so they were very grateful. And so the book comes out. <clears throat> and Don, they closed like two months after <laughs> the book came out. And, and they'd been around for like, you know, 60 years. And I felt kind of guilty. Yeah. Like, did I put these poor people out of business somehow? Um, and so, yeah, that, but that was one of my, my early favorites. Um, you can probably tell by looking at me, I'm not a real um, uh, foodie person. You know, I'm just kind of a skinny guy that doesn't eat. You know, I kind of eat like a bird. So I'm, I'm, I'm the least qualified person, certainly in St. Louis and in the travel world to write about food. Um, but I'm trying. And, you know, and it's interesting because I, I've, I've always been sort of a picky eater. But when you do these trips and you, you meet these different people, you, you really have to, you have to be more adventurous. And so I remember I did a story on a guy. He worked for the Food Network and he was in, this is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
And he, uh, he, I walked in and I thought we were just going to chat, do a quick little, you know, interview, and I was going to be out the door. I walk in and Don, he had this whole spread of Cajun food and a team of people that were with him from the Food Network. And so you want to talk about pressure? And I had to sit there and I ate every single thing on the plate, right down to the raw oysters and the, I mean any other kind of Cajun food you can think of. Um, so it's been actually good for me as a finicky eater to kind of have to taste new things. So, in fact, you actually were eating like a bird because I told <laughs> if, if we ate like birds, we'd weigh about 600 pounds and eat about a ton a day. <laughs> a tiny bird, maybe, a you know, a hummingbird, maybe. But, yeah, no, I, so it's that, that part has actually been fun because I have learned that I like certain things that I never in a million years would have thought I liked. Was there any place that you uh, wouldn't go back to? <laughs> Um, I have a few, but there are actually not very many. I mean, yeah. r- truly, I-, I can find, so- and it's, it's sort of one of these things where I can find something positive about any place. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you just a quick example. So Little Rock, Arkansas was, was a trip that I took, and I've been back many times since. And, you know, one of the things I do when I plan a route, you know, I'll, I'll tell some friends about it. I'll say, hey, mm-hmm. these are some of the places I'm thinking about going. And I'll, I'll never forget there was uh, a, one, one lady who, when I mentioned Little Rock, Arkansas, she she just kind of rolled her eyes and she said, oh, you don't want to go to Little Rock. Mm-hmm. And she must have had some bad experience or, or whatever. And so um, in my head, this is the way I operate, I said, okay, well, that now moves to the top of the list. Mm-hmm. I'm definitely going. And I'm so glad that I did because I loved it and met some amazing people. You talk about food, a really uh, kind of a hidden foodie city. Um, just lo- lots of great improvements that they have made over the years, starting with that Clinton Presidential Library that went in and all of the businesses that came to town because of it. Uh, and I love Little Rock now. So that's sort of one of my things when people kind of – boo-hoo a destination, I go because I can find something positive in every place. You've got a a sports category as well. And of course, St. Louis is, as we all know, a great sports town. What did you find uh, that might compete with St. Louis out there? Well, you know, I mentioned uh, in the book that Cooperstown is certainly an experience to have. And, you know, I took my dad on a road trip up there couple years ago, two or three years ago. And, you know, I, I feel like they, they put the Baseball Hall of Fame really, it's, it's not easy to get there, let's yeah. just say. And, and I think that actually makes it for a better experience because you really have to take a trek to get to Cooperstown. And when you walk in and just those hollowed halls with, you know, it, it's just an amazing experience to have. And, you know, I always say, if you're going to go do it if you're going to go with a parent, you know, whether it's your father, your your mother, whatever, the one that you would, you know, you, you best associate baseball games with in those experiences. Because we went to Bush Stadium all the time when we were kids and saw the Cardinal games, of course. And so to go there and experience that with with a, a parent, in my case, my dad, it was amazing. And, and, and I hear I heard from people while I was there that said, you know what, you were so smart to have taken your father because my dad and I, you know, we always talked about it, or my mom and I, we always talked about going, and we never did. And so I was really glad that we we did that and we checked it off, forgive the phrase, checked it off the bucket mm-hmm. list. Um, and so that's, you know, one thing I certainly recommend people do. If you're talking about it, don't quit talking about it, just do it. Go yeah. do it. Yeah, in most cases, too, uh, there is a connection between uh, baseball and fathers and sons. I mean, that's basically where the where the interest in the game. And begins. I know, and I, I always feel a little guilty mm-hmm. saying that because I know that there are obviously many women who love sport. In fact, you know, they know more about sports than I do. Um, but you're right; there, it does come down to a father son connection, and, and, and maybe that's through marketing or through whatever. But you know, whether you see you're playing, you know, catching the front yard, you know, throwing the ball back and forth, you yeah. see fathers and sons, um, and so whatever the case may be, to go and, and have that experience with with a parent certainly we have a uh, a call from george he's uh, written in apparently saying uh, is is the meteor crater in arizona on your list meteor crater in arizona i can't say that i I've, <laughs> I've put that on the list but I would go. Like, I love stuff like that. You know, we were just talking in the green room earlier, uh, and yes, they have a green room here. I've never been in a radio station in St. Louis that has a green room, so congratulations. Um, and we were talking about how I will stop for every little thing along the way. And I love like, the roadside attractions, and I love, you know, if there's one of those brown signs on the highway that says historic, blah, 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 I, I get off the road and I go and see it. And that, to me, is what makes a road trip just an awesome experience it is those little things along the way. And, and too many people just rush to point, you know, the point A to point B, and they don't stop along the way and see those those fun things. So did, uh, sure, I'd go to a meteor crater. Why not? Did you find any Burma shave signs along the way? I did oh, not. Right. I don't even know what that is. What is that? 
oh, it's an old form of advertising which Burma Shave would put up no. a series of signs that would tell a little bit of a story or have a slogan. Well, Wall Drug would be like that. And have you been there in South Dakota? So they have all the. No, I've never been to South Dakota. Are I you? probably never will. Oh, Bill. my gosh. <laughs> you had a girlfriend there. Yeah, I excuse. did, yeah. And now I'll never go back. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, no, so that Wall Drug is famous for, um, you know, they, used, they would offer free. Ice water. That's how they got people yeah. to pull off the road many, 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 many years ago. And now if you drive across South Dakota, you will see, like you're talking about, they'll see a hundred billboards all telling yeah. you sort of the story of wall drug. Yeah. And so, oh, you should go to South Dakota. It's beautiful. Well, I'll, I'll put that we'll on road, my bucket we'll road list. road trip together. It'll be number yeah. 100 on my bucket <laughs> list. Tim from Baldwin writes, he's curious about the process involved in becoming a travel writer. Well, that's a good question. So I, I was, I'm, I'm lucky because I'd been on the radio in town for a long time and sort of had, you know, for example, when I first started, you could Google Bill Cleveland and things would pop up. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me a little bit of credibility to where, you know, when I would reach out to different cities, they would go, oh, okay, well, this guy's legit. He's not just somebody that started, you know, is in his basement writing on a, a blog. And so that earned a little bit of credibility to get, to get going. But otherwise it, it can be really tough. And you're talking about the funding, you know, it, it's, it's really tough to make a living as a traveler. I, I tell people all the time, I said, I will never get to retire. I probably will never right. retire unless I, you know, it, 100 Things to Do in America Before You Die is, it was a fun book, but it's not a Pulitzer Prize winner. I'm not going to retire based on book sales. Um, but it's fun. And so at the end of the day, you sort of weigh, do I want to make a ton of money or do I want to be able to, you know, go through life and have really great experiences, having met amazing people across the country, getting to do things that most people can't do, um, or, you know, they won't have the time to do all of these things. So, you know, I always come back to, hey, I'm having great experiences and my life is fuller because of it. Is this in any way diverting you from your radio ambitions? I know that you've you, you've wanted to do radio and do uh, television, too, for a long, long time. And you still do some of it with this, but this seems to be taking over. Well, this so the great thing is about this is that I can do a lot of these things that I love in small doses. So if I'm on a television show or a program and I'm talking about travel... Um, that sort of can fulfills that you know mm -hmm. thing that I, I like about it. radio. Same deal. I'm on in St. Louis as you mentioned, and I do things around the country, um, some different stations. Um, I've done stuff on satellite radio, and so you know, getting to do both of those, but talk about travel and people love it. I'm always surprised that you know how 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 relatable travel is because we've all taken road trips, we've all taken trips, and then for people, you know, I hear from people who can't travel you know there are people i have one guy god love him who um he's a um, a veteran and he's disabled and he's unable to travel but he follows my website and he follows all of my social media posts and he will send me messages and say thank you for sharing these things i can't go i can't afford to go and it's physically it's really really tough for me to do any traveling but i get to travel vicariously through you and that's that's wonderful to hear. It's also a great responsibility. And I think about those things when I travel and I, I share stories. I want people, if they can't travel, to be able to do so through the words that I've written or the pictures I've taken. Not all trips are, uh, are, are totally successful. There are mishaps, missteps along the way. What were some not of Not mine. Yours? Not no, yours. Every one of them is absolutely perfect. <laughs> no flat tires no, or anything like I, that. Um, wow, that's a great question. I, you know, I'm sort of meticulous where I do... I. I I'm really good at planning because you have to be. Um, and so, and I always give myself a little time in between to like to stop as I say, I love stopping along the road. I, you know, knock on, is this wood? This is not really wood. Um, I haven't had a really horrible experience. I've had a couple of instances where I've stayed in places where, you know, the surroundings were not as great as I had hoped they would be. Um, but those are far and few between. And you know what? So what? You know, if you're annoyed at the time, it's fine. You got to look at the big picture. And overall, I've had an amazing experience. You know, that you're talking about road trips and uh, it's, getting to Hawaii is a little bit difficult <laughs> by road, but but you do manage to include some Hawaii sites in as well. Um, I, I included Pearl Harbor. I think you have to include Pearl Harbor. But you're you know you're right. It that that was that was sort of a, a struggle that I had. But you can you can still go. It, it's fine. You know, don't drive obviously across the across the ocean. Uh, I included Alaska too. You can get there. But you know. Whatever. It, it, they're great experiences. I only included one in Hawaii and one in, in Alaska. But for the most part, 
I'm talking about traveling, you know, throughout the 48. And um, and there's so much to see, Don. I mean, it's amazing. I, I have friends that are travel writers who um, are really excited to, to you know hop on a plane and go to Europe or to go to wherever, and that's cool. And and we we need to hear those stories. But I think people forget how much stuff that we have here in the United States and how much we have here in just our own backyard. I mean, yeah. even just in St. Louis, I forget. Sure. In, in Missouri, I, I yesterday I went to the uh, Bellefontaine, um, am I saying that right? The uh, cemetery. Bell, Bell Fountain Cemetery. Bell, Bell yeah. I've never been there. I've been hearing, right. hearing about this for oh. close to 40 years. I've never gone. Yesterday I went. And so, you know, to remember to go and see things in your own backyard too, I think is important. Yeah. One of the things uh, I would note about the book, uh, and I don't think there are enough of them, you have some wonderful pictures in there, color photographs that are- pictures are expensive to print, but thank you. I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I love taking pictures, and, and thank you for that. Um, Instagram is a really awesome tool that, that you know I, I love, and I'm always sharing pictures on there, and um, and it's fun to share the stories along with those those photographs. Um, but yeah, the folks at Reedy Press were really nice to. I think mine is the only one of all of their books that have color p- pictures in the middle. I don't think any of the other ones have color pictures. And, and your book obviously survived the fire that uh, unfortunately it struck did the not. Reedy. It did not survive the fire. They, mm. it, they they went up in flames. They had just so this like, technically I guess it's the third printing, which yeah. sounds really impressive if people uh-huh. don't know the fire story um but yeah and that warehouse fire last november i guess it was yeah lost uh, almost the entire second printing of, of the book uh, and thankfully they were really quick to get an, a new badge out and so we kind of missed the christmas season mm-hmm. um which is important if you're trying to make a living but hey i wasn't in the fire thank god I'm glad to hear that uh, Josh survived that. Josh Stevens, yes. uh, owner of Reedy Press, uh-huh. survived the fire so yeah. that he could continue an operation. One final thing I want to point out because it was my favorite part of the book. Not that anyone cares about that. I care. But I love I loved the trivia questions. I mean, <laughs> they, they were a lot of fun. And, and you can learn a lot by just going through the trivia section. It's funny. Thank you for saying that. You know, all of the other books <clears throat> have little fun facts and factoids. And yeah. I, I maybe just to be different and to be a, a, yeah. I, I said, I would like to do trivia. And I just met some somebody last week traveling with on an, an RV and they had my book and they said, you know what we've been doing all the way. We've been playing these trivia questions as we're driving yeah. along. And so that made me feel really good. So how many did you get right? Did you keep track? I, I didn't keep track, oh. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I, I think I've looked at all of them. But yeah, I, I would think that uh, coming up with that information is as difficult <laughs> In well, some I ways, used to do a lot of, tr- used it. to do a lot of trivia nights in St. Louis, so I kind of knew how to write trivia questions, and so I was glad I was able to incorporate those in. Any signings or anything coming up that you want people to know about? Uh, unless you're going to be in Wichita, Kansas, um, which maybe you've got listeners in Wichita. We've got an no. event coming up uh, in a couple of weeks out there, but uh, okay. not not locally. Well, I don't plan to be in Wichita either, oh, Bill. <laughs> I'm just not traveling as much as I used to. No, it's okay. Thanks so much, Bill, for being with us. My and pleasure. Once again, the title of the book is 100 Things to Do in America Before You Die. Thank you again. Good luck with uh, future editions of the book. Thank you. Good to see you, Don. That's Bill Cleveland. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.